Hello, everyone. Do I have a clear audio channel? Sound great. Awesome. Wow, that was that was amazing and goosebump giving. I assure you that nothing I'm going to present to you is going to be that flashy. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm humbled and honored to participate in this uh, World Series or Olympics or whatever you want to call it about you know design visualization. And um, I believe I have a gold medal story to tell, and I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, but before I do. I have to mention that there, there wouldn't have been any celebration on our end, no victory dance or cracking of champagne or whatever you want to call it, if it weren't for a couple of key individuals that I need to give shout outs to on the key shot side. Um, big thanks to Jeff Hayden and Luxion Studios, uh, Lux, Key Shot Luxion, for years of friendship and, um, and Jeff for taking my calls at unholy times of the night or morning. Um, I used to think I was special, but I, uh, I know I'm not because my design peers tell me that, you know, you guys treat every customer like a number one customer. I don't know how you do it, uh, but you do it really well. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the support and friendship. And also, by the way, for all the work that Luxion does, to, you know, support events like this and um, to help uh, enrich um, our community of designers and help us perfect our craft. Uh, much love for that. And um, also a really big shout out to um, Brian Edelman. I'm sorry, I said Brian because I know a Brian. Brad Edelman from T-Shot Studio. Uh, Brad and his team um, were really instrumental in helping us create a transformative business process that helped us pivot in a time of crisis. Um, you know, we never were lost in space, never alone in the capsule. We always were able to connect with um, Brad and his team uh, at Mission Control, and, um, and we always felt like we were going to be guided home safely. So um, much thanks for the, for the amazing support. Um, before I go on, I, I also want to mention that uh, my email's up there. Uh, frank.tineski at kids2.com. If you have any questions or inquiries that you have and you want to reach out, just use the subject matter in the email queue for you. That's questions for you. So if you have a question for me, uh, I'll do a search at the end of the week and I'll, I'll know that your emails are legitimate. So I know how to filter those from spam and I'll try to respond as quickly as I can. And I'll put that up there again at the end. Um, so um, a little bit about kids too. Um, Kids2 is a global uh, multinational company privately held. Um, we have design centers in Atlanta, which is our headquarters. Um, we have a well-established design center in Hong Kong, um, uh, a center in Amsterdam. And the picture you see here is of our newly christened office in Shanghai. It's actually in the, the new Ginsler building, the Shanghai Tower. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting there and uh, working above the clouds. Um, this is kind of what all our offices look like, but this is this is what our newest office is. Um, we also have design and development partners around the world. Um, we own or co-own factories. So honestly, the sun never sets on design and development at Kids Do. It's kind of an always on, always connected enterprise. And um, take note of this, we're actually looking for an industrial designer in the Hong Kong region. So for our Hong Kong office, if you are an industrial designer, or if you know an industrial designer who might qualify or be interested, um, please reach out to me or connect us, connect with us on our career page at kids2.com. So you may not have heard of Kids2, and that's okay, um, because we don't produce products under the Kids2 nameplate. Um, but uh, you've likely heard of these brands, especially if you're a parent. Um, Baby Einstein is probably one of our biggest brands. It's, it's really about playful products that encourage curiosity, and they also support cognitive learning development. Some pretty neat, neat line of products we have there. And then our Bright Stars line in the middle is all about affordable, joyful toys and experiences that make babies smile. And our Ingenuity, and there's another sub-brand of Ingenuity called Itty, um, that's really a large array of, of great gear options that are that are you know fun for kids, but really designed to be functional for parents to help them raise safer, healthier you know children. Uh, and that includes products like high chairs, bassinets, rockers, jumpers, gyms, walkers. I mean, it goes on. It's quite a large portfolio of product there. And um, we have a collaborative partnership with a a company called Hoppe. They're experts in manufacturing wood furniture and wood products. And um, we leverage their expertise to produce modern products with a heritage feel. So I like to call these forever toys because um, they have a really nice, you know, feel to them. They're real wood, fun to render in key shot, by the way. And, um, and they use, they use cap touch technology to create a really nice, you know, clean user experience. 
Uh, this piano on the left actually won uh, Toy of the Year a couple of years ago. Um, also under our umbrella of brands is licensed properties. I'm sure you know about Elmo and Sesame Street um, and uh, Disney Baby is huge. Um, if you buy a toy from John Deere, Ford or Mercedes Benz, it could be one of ours. Um, so there's a lot going on at any given moment. Um, there's about 130 so products in flight on any day. So it's a big business, um, a lot, a lot happening at kids too. Um, but really what I want to share with you today is kind of a snapshot of 2020 and how Keyshot helped us pivot in a time of crisis um, to establish context, you know, always going really well um, until, you know, unforeseen changes, you know, brought on by COVID kind of forces to rethink how we could fulfill certain mission critical business objectives. You know, specifically, you know, how could industrial design, engineering, trends and fashion experts and photo retouchers collaborate to support product launches with photo real renderings and animations also when we couldn't get models? I'm gonna share that story with you. That's a pretty big one. Um, but a little more context first. Um, we have about 25,000 brick and mortar locations in 27 countries. So we're everywhere. And if you're in North America, you'll recognize the usual suspects there, the Targets, the Walmarts, the Amazons and Bye Byes, or our big retail centers, big, big clients for us, right? And um, it's natural for us or any design firm or, or company to collaborate with their buyers. Um, that's the best way to develop world-class products is to collaborate, right? Well, the, the buyers that we're working with or interfacing with, they have a high level of design literacy. They know the process or they know it well enough that, you know, they understand that the objective is to share an idea. And, you know, there's not really a need for us to convince them that what we're showing them is, is photo real. Um, in fact, I would say that in some cases, not all, a sketch will do. So this next slide might be sacrilege here in a among a community of you know expert renderers but it's really intended to illustrate a point and that um in some cases good is good enough now, I, I pulled this image from before i actually started at kids too this is pretty old but it's illustrative of sort of a mix of you know 3d and 2d um and is sort of indicative of how we would collaborate or communicate with you know um, with partners or, or, or buyers in, in a development scenario. And um, it really shows that, you know, um, it's an okay, uh, you know, communications tool, but it's it's really not going to convince anybody that this is photo real, right? You would, you would never mistake this for a photograph. Um, but it, it's a great way to quickly share ideas. And, you know, we also have to be mindful of how much time designers invest in creating great ideas. So the idea of good is good enough is sort of um, something that something to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, now, if I look at all the inbound uh, data coming in to create these concept renderings, and these are the usual suspects, right? Um, I happen to be an alias user and key shot user when I can. You know, I don't have much time to drive a three button mouse, but when I, when I get the chance, I like to keep it real, I use the tools. Um, but our teams and our external partners and, and consultants we work with, we're using a variety of different tools and they were using those tools to produce you know, discrete rendering. So we might have a, a Rhino rendering and a 3D Max rendering and, and you know, some photo and illustrator stuff, et cetera. And we, we would use those, those renderings um, to communicate um, and we would use the CAD to manage through the development, you know, and, and process with the engineering. And um, this is pretty rote, right? We, this is pretty much how it's done everywhere. And, um, you know, eventually you move through a series or a battery of prototype models. And somewhere around where the gray line is there is where things kind of would move, not out of sight, but more or less out of our hands. That's about the period where, you know, um, we're turning over our data to create a golden sample that would ultimately be made and uh, carefully marshaled over to you know, the people who need it. And um, we would usually see it. Uh, but what happens when um, when the quarantine impacted our ability to generate these appearance models? We simply couldn't get golden samples. And suddenly product launches, collateral, packaging, and the digital shelf, all those things that pin to photography, um, we're in jeopardy. 
And <laughs> this was a really big problem for us. Um, we could print 3D models all day long. Um, that wasn't a problem. Um, you know, it's mostly a hands-off process um, because, you know, we, you know, the designers could basically submit their data to the 3D printer and almost curbside pick up their models and evaluate them, et cetera. Um, you know, on, lo on location, we can print a, a full-size high chair, for example, on one of our large 3D printers, and we often do. It's quite amazing. Um, but the one problem we had is that appearance models, it sort of takes a village to create an appearance model. You know, when you think about all the hands that touch an appearance model, surface preparation for paint, uh, graphics for transfer, um, you know, fabric printing in some cases and fabrication, color matching, uh, there's the painting and polishing and, and material simulations, et cetera. Um, well, those people weren't going to work. Everyone was quarantined and all the model shops were subsequently shut down. So, you know, that was a problem. And also, um, you know, these models were also very expensive, something to keep in mind. So we had a real problem. The problem was not just an inconvenience, it was a big business problem. And um, even the models we had on location, we couldn't photograph them. Um, you know, it was just too dangerous to get and assemble people. And of course, many of our products include the inclusion of children in the scene. So there was no way that we could assemble moms and children and, and, uh, and acquire models and do what would be traditional, be, you know, location-based photography. There's no way to do it. So we were kind of in a bind. Um, the thought of quarantine impacting all location-based photography and photo shoots um, at first felt like an inconvenience. Um, but then when you look at the numbers, you go, oh boy, it's not an inconvenience. It's a huge problem. In 2020, we had 48 products releasing in Q2, Q3, and Q4 that pinned to 22 million in projected sales. That's huge. Now we're privately held companies, so I can't share our numbers, but I can tell you, I don't care how big you are when you're looking at a $22 million hit, people get serious really fast. And, uh, and that's what we had to do. So we were starting to scramble look for solutions and figuring out, you know, what we could do. Because remember, uh, everything I shared with you previously, you know, the mission critical need was we needed to launch products. We needed to build collateral. We needed digital um, shelf materials. We needed packaging, you know, illustrations for, for assembly, et cetera. And we weren't able to fulfill these needs, which put our revenue goals in real jeopardy. So what to do? Well, um, as you can imagine, we, we kind of all got together and because my design team uh, and engineering teams um, all had to sort of collaborate and we were sort of closest to the solution, um, we needed the solution fast. And you know, the obvious question was, what if we can produce you know, convincingly real photo images from our cat? And while that sounded like a great idea, um, and it is a great idea, we also found ourselves in a situation in which the tools we had right? We're not going to take us to the summit. So um, I know you can't provide any feedback to me, but um, if any of you have seen the movie Free Solo, this will, you know, might relate. Um, as a mountain climber, um, or not being a mountain climber, you might think that uh, you just keep going up, right? You just keep going north. How hard can it be? And it turns out that's not always the case. I'm going to explain the analogy here in a moment, but we found ourselves on this ledge, right, where we couldn't go any farther north. We were pretty far up the technical mountain, but we couldn't get to the summit from where we were. And that was a problem because we had to close that gap pretty quickly from, you know, from renderings that looked good enough. And remember, good enough was good enough for us, the design team, but not good enough to carry it the last mile, be convincingly real and support the back end of, you know, um, merchandising and packaging and all the things we talked about. So we had a gap to close. Continuing with the analogy of Free Solo, uh, which, by the way, is the movie uh, is about a guy named Alex Honnold. I probably uh, butchered his name, but this crazy cat climbs El Capitan without a rope. And I highly recommend the watch. Um, you will twist and turn in your chair like you're trying to wiggle out of a straight jacket. Uh, it's fascinating to watch. But um, there's a point in, in the movie. It's not the point of the movie, by the way, but there's a point here just, just where he is about now where he can't go any further. Of course, he knows this, right? 
kind of a bummer if he didn't know that and he got that far up and goes, uh oh, what do I do? But that's kind of what happened to us. We were kind of at the, you know, they are stuck on the ledge. Like, where do we go from here? Um, well, anyway, in the movie, what I didn't know about climbing and of course learned when I watched the documentary is that a climber sometimes has to go sideways and down for a long way before they can find the next path up. So imagine climbing all that way, death defying, only have to go you know, many stories down and sideways before you can find the, the next path. And that's kind of where we found ourselves. We realized the tools we had and the process we had in play weren't going to get us to the summit. We needed, we needed a solution. Um, thankfully, as a longtime Keyshot user and as a friend of, of the folks at Keyshot and knowing uh, you know, the tools really well, I was pretty convinced it was the right solution. I knew it was the right solution because I had done my homework previously. So we didn't spend a lot of time flushing out or considering other software packages because we were pretty convinced that Keyshot was um, was the right tool for us for a number of reasons. Um, so we went about procurement and system setup and staffing and interoperability of files and cross-functional collaboration, et cetera, um, which by the way, was really well supported both by Jeff and from, from Brad um, at Keyshot Studios. So again, thanks to them. and. And, um, you know, what was really important about why I use this analogy is that we didn't have to go sideways and down for very long before we were on a rapid ascent to a higher level of quality and communications in our tools that we were using. So it was clearly the right choice. But to understand this meant that we had to sort of unpack the mechanics of our product launch process, right? And understand the machinery of our business. Now, you know, we understand the design machinery of our business. That's what we do every day. But there was this whole other back end of the part of, you know, where, where digital shelf and collaboration and photo retouching and all that stuff was, you know, we're certainly friends and neighbors, but we really didn't work together. Not like, you know, not like we didn't function like one moving part. And now we do. Um, so I, I'm a bit of a motorhead, truth be told, but imagine like you're bolting on this supercharger uh, onto the block of your organization, and now you're going to have more volumetric efficiency moving through with all this added horsepower. It's the right analogy, but you know the machinery of our business is quite complex, right? We had many, many files coming in from disparate sources all over the world. You might have a an assembly coming in, you know, in Creo or Pro E from a manufacturer. We might have a softwares package coming in from. Um, from, from a consultant as an OBJ, we might have SDL files or, or step files and, you know, wire files from Alias and, and gosh, the, you know, I just files for legacy users, all kinds of stuff, right? Very complex. So we really had to get tight in our organization first. So as strong as um, Keyshot is in terms of being a great visualization tool, we really had to get our machinery in order to really be able to make this work smoothly. Remember, we had a lot of products, 48 products, right? We needed to knock out. So this isn't a one and done thing. This is like a lot of product we needed to move through and create a transformative process on the run, right? We had to build this motor while we were going down the road. Um, and um, with only about a month on the clock, you know, we, we were able to bolt on all this new horsepower and, uh, and break in our systems, both on Mac and PC. And, uh, and train our internal you know, designers and our retouchers. I, I want to get to that later, but um, in a minute, but not just industrial designers were tra trained up on Keyshot, but also our photo retouchers. And that's an important uh, element that I want you to take away. Um, in a relatively short period, um, we were making tremendous strides. Um, this is a rendering captured that's sort of as analogous to the other rendering, and you'll see it's significantly better. Um, so our good, became much better um, through Keyshot and it became much better really quickly. Um, you know, the photo team uh, also started learning Keyshot and, and learning the UI. It's really, it's really a nod to the quality of the UI in, in, in Keyshot because they had no previous experience using 3D tools. They were, you know, they were using Lightroom and, and Photoshop and such. So 3D was a little bit of a freak out for them at first, but they took to it really well. So again, within days, our designers were producing renderings that were at par or better than the tools they were previously using without many pain, which is really great. Um, and our photo team, you know, there's no way they're going to retire their cameras or hang up their tripods, but now they have these augmented tools that they're able to use. Now, shortly after that, we started getting real. Now this is when it starts getting fun. 
Um, I already mentioned that we, you know, we were able to get from, from, you know, from nothing to pretty darn good in, in just a few days. But now my team was starting to produce renderings that were looking convincingly, convincingly real. Again, with some good help and advisement from D-Shot Studios, um, because you know we didn't go it alone. We got some support. Um, it was modest support. It wasn't they were holding our hands, but they trained us up really well. And you know now we're producing renderings with really good quality. Albeit these Im images took a little more time, a little more care and feeding to produce. So the question becomes, you know, really good, really good. Creating the ability to create really good renderings in minutes is um, is really great because it does something for us where it accelerates the cycle time. Um, the ability for us designers to be able to produce really good renderings, but not photoreal renderings quickly, accelerates the cycle time and it increases the volumetric efficiency that designers have. They can produce more stuff. They can they can flesh out more ideas, generate more concepts. And collaborate more to to uh, it's like more turns at bat when you're not waiting or, or struggling with the tools. Um, but we are also able to take the same key shot rendering full renders like the same files and um, and park those in a in a in a place where our photo team can access them and they could take our ID renderings and turn them from good to great. So. What a great way for the photo team to sort of, you know, augment our products with all the tools and all the things they enjoy um, by using Keyshot as a tool um, to help us create better renderings. Now, these are here's a, this is basically a screen scrape of some of the first renderings being generated by our photo team. Um, you'll see that they imported our. CAD that we generated from design um, and our, our very kind of pseudo raw uh, KSP file and kind of goosed it up to look pretty good. Um, the baby that's been added there uh, to show context is actually digitally rendered in. Um, I don't know that we'd want to do that all the time. It's a little labor uh, to do that, but when we needed to, we pulled it off. Uh, and being able to do that meant that we were able to meet those product launches. And um, this is not going to be, you know, that shocking to you guys, but in many cases, things where the, um, the quality of the rendering, uh, uptight, right? Like, um, the ability to sort of zoom in, I would say that it would be pretty hard for us to produce a model, a physical model, an appearance model that has this level of fidelity, uh, and precision and realism. Um, it would be very difficult, right? It would be very difficult for us to produce this as a, as a, as a looks like appearance model. And if we did, uh, or when we do, it's very expensive. So um, imagine polishing both sides of those plastic pieces and getting everything just so. And here we have it in Keyshot, and um, you can see the obvious benefit of using the tool um, or augmenting photography with our digital tools. So Keyshot really helped us get to the mountain. And um, here's an example. Uh, these are, again, just some screen scrapes of some of the toys that were generated on our team, um, you know, producing the uh, effects of that very complex light assembly uh, or the translucency that exists in this part assembly would have been very difficult and is very difficult to do when we would traditionally use a, a physical model to photograph. Um, so now we can use a hybrid of both. We still use real physical models because we're, we're back in business and making models again, but now our model business is augmented with digital photography which really helps the whole ecosystem of visual communications, collateral, digital shelf, et cetera. It's really a big deal for us. And here's a screen scrape of the digital shelf. You can see some of those products in play, um, you know, and um, this is real. This is like, these are the real photo renderings that we did or we collaborated with our photo team uh, to rescue those product launches and they're in market. So we were able to pull this off and again, uh, many thanks for all the people involved, including my own team, by the way. I need to mention that um, while there's a lot of, you know, accolades going to, to both Keyshot and the great support we, re we received, our internal team was really committed to the goal. So, you know, much props to, uh, to the folks internally who did that as well. Here's a screen scrape of a real Amazon, uh, just literally just a, a screen capture of our Amazon page. I, I don't think anyone would, would look at that image and, you know, be um, uh, 
you know, would, would, would think that it's a digital image. It is uh, on the left and, um, and its product's doing really well. And I'll take the four and a half stars from Amazon. Thank you, Amazon. Um, the product is blowing, going and, and doing really well and was essentially rescued because we were able to meet the objectives of those product launches with the support we received and the tools we used. So this is, um, this slide is, is a bit of, well, it's, it's almost like the, uh, like the conference proceedings topics that are being offered in here, it's not proprietary, yeah. but for anyone who is rather new to the field, it might be relevant. You know, if you're not, you know, deep into this as we are, um, you know, the future of this stuff is really, really makes sense. And there's an extensibility to using these tools that obviously makes sense. I mean, what's beyond the digital shelf? Well, augmented reality and visualization tools are going to reduce the number of physical prototypes required. You know, we we can reduce our costs by producing more digital. Uh, prototypes it, it certainly accelerates the cycle time. We're not able to ship, or we, we are able, or we are able to ship these models digitally. So you're shipping atoms, not bits. Um, those bits are updatable. So if you make a change, it's not like oh, the model left in FedEx. You know, we didn't get the change in. Uh, it's fully updatable. Uh, it's way more environmental. Um, even when we produce these fantastically beautiful, really great, you know, physical models that might be even better than a production model, we have to destroy them. Um, because you know of regulatory requirements, so it's a shame to do it. But you know we burn a lot of plastic. We make we burn through a lot of material. So any opportunity we have to to be friendly to the environment, we certainly take that seriously. Uh, there's analytics on customer traffic that can be gathered. That's important. Um, we improve the retail sell-in. Um, it's transmissive, right? Because we're able to uh, again send those atoms, not bits. Um, the buyers can make conjoint decisions in real time with us. That's so a great way to collaborate. And um, we can create animated features that show off feature sets. Um, we're able to keep uh, the models, like they're able to keep the digital models. There's always a challenge with, you know, how to store or keep or catalog models. These digital models are a lot easier to transport. Um, and um, we're able to provide some contextual views. You can see the product in your own home. Um, your, you know, the assembly videos on YouTube, a digital manual, that makes all make sense. Uh, animated features and and aspirational images that are really more inspiring than a static image. So um, that's really how things happen for us at Kids2. Um, that's a summation of my story. Um, I think I have a little bit of time left, um, but uh, again, there's my email if you have any questions. And um, now I'll just, I guess I'll open it up for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Frank. That was a great kind of insight into, you know, the. The business side of the equation, right? People often think of of Keyshot from sort of the end product and those those great uh, visualizations, but you really kind of hit the nail on the head of of where those those cost savings come from the ROI standpoint um, with your investment on Keyshot. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first things first, uh, the banana phone. I like one <laughs> yeah. of those. Is that, is that work on iOS? Do you know? <laughs> You know, I, I have a long history having led design for uh, BlackBerry and Motorola and Kyocera doing mobile phones. And um, yeah, I, I didn't do the banana phone, but I, I quite adore it. And, um, yeah, I'm, and I'm, all <laughs> in the, I'm all in on the banana phone. So just, you know, you know yeah. uh, when, I, when, when that comes out, let me know. Um, yeah. Uh, qu question. So, I mean, obviously, you know, big changes sort of spurred on by you having to work from home. Was, was this more of a bottom down sort of decision or a or a, uh, sorry, a bottom up or a top down. And, and what I mean by that was, you know, was this being driven by, you know, the executive saying we have to get these things to market, find a way, or more the team just realizing that we had to alter our collaboration tools in order to, you know, deliver on mm -hmm. uh, these products or a yeah. combination of both. Well, you know, you know, one of the great benefits of kids too is that, you know, like you, I've already expressed how large and, you know, how, how massive our company is, how important our company is. But we, we still operate like a startup. Um, it still has a very like, hey, I'll I'll push a broom if I if I can help the company make make a success, you know, anywhere. So and, and that's sort of the attitude of the company. We we've, we've got a really kind of an all in, uh, let's do this mentality. So what I found is that um, once we got through the sort of um, the fear factor of really looking at the machinery that I shared with you and going, oh my goodness, this is going to be complex, right? Look at all these things that have to come together like a complex orchestra of pieces and parts that all have to come together brilliantly and seamlessly to make it work. Um, and that was a little bit um, challenging because it involved the participation and collaboration of you know 
multifunctional cross-disciplinary teams to really commit, right? Um, but I think everyone was really on board because our organization's pretty flat. I mean, I, I mentioned that, you know, as a vice president, normally um, they wouldn't let me touch a three-button mouse. But, you know, in this case, I had a chance to sort of jettison some of my strategic activities to lead this other important initiative, this mission critical, mission critical, mission critical <laughs> initiative to, you know, to, to jump in and, and, and pull this off. Um, so it, it really is the, um, the ethos of kids too to sort of jump in. It was not really uh, bottom down because I think um, we, it never got to the top, right? Um, or, or top down uh, because we, we recognize the problem sort of in the, in the middle. And, um, and then we manage through the problem together as a team. Um, so it really is not a, it's not solely an industrial design story or a design and experience story. It's really a, a cross-functional story of, you know, rallying around a big challenge. Uh, you know, what do we do? And um, this is about helping your brothers and sisters in other departments and realizing that the, the, uh, the muscle we needed to build and, and the connective tissue we needed to build, not just internally, but also with our partners was was really important. And um, COVID kind of forced us to sort of, you know, to make it happen. And then in terms of like collaboration across these files, I mean, how did this change kind of how you, you know, move data? I mean, obviously you were saying how you, you ah, know, uh, firms across, uh, you know, across sure. the globe. Yeah, how did, can you talk a bit about that? Sure. Um, I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, I might just, scoot back up to uh, a part of the presentation where um, where I show the process and, and we had a bunch of people producing products, images, and a disparate collection of software packages, 3D Studio Max. Um, Creo has you know a, a version of Keyshot in that we were using. So some of our folks were actually using a version of Keyshot. Um, Alias, you know, um, uh, and Rhino and all these different you know, rendering tools were being used with, with a mixed bag of results. There was no consistency. Um, so we had, you know, some stuff was really great. Some stuff was okay. Um, but, you know, what now we all use Keyshot. So we're, we're converging on some of our software platforms and there's some proprietary stuff there I can't really talk about, but I can tell you this, we are, we're all producing renderings now in Keyshot, full stop. And what that allows us to do is rather than have a mixed bag of, I can't open your 3DS file or, you know, I can't open your, um, you know, your Rhino file. Um, we now have a system in which when our designers render in Keyshot, um, it is a transmissive file that can move across our organization. So now our photo team can open it, our partners can open it. And we also found, uh, not surprisingly, I know you know this, but, um, but most of our partners are already using Keyshot. So we actually had a disadvantage when we didn't have Keyshot in-house because some of our design consultants might push a rendering to us and we'd say, hey, you know, this is really great, but we couldn't change the color of something ourselves, right? Because they, they had a KSP file we, we couldn't open. So by converging um, on all of on one platform for rendering, we, we sort of get the interoperability that we're missing before. Um, and with that interoperability, though, requires the discipline of having to be able to, you know, organize all these disparate collections of files coming from all over the place in one place, so that your 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 texture maps and your your graphic patterns for fashion and your graphics and all those things are sort of organized into folders, um, and we had to create the institutional discipline to sort of create a new transformative way of working that everyone sort of would sign on to doing that. Um, we couldn't have done that if the results weren't great or the mission wasn't so important. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't want to wish COVID on anybody. Um, but as the story goes, out of everything bad comes something good, right? And I think that this this, this crisis we are in actually forced us to uh, to do this in a hyper accelerated way. Great. And then what one one person's asking, you know, in terms of like looking at that slide and kind of how. Were there any major design decisions where you changed that, you know, as a result of this process where, you know, you clearly saw, hey, you know, this is, you know, because we have this this uh, realistic visual early in the process, we're going to go a different direction with, you know, a material or uh, a finish or anything like that. Oh, yeah. I, I think um, I think that the the tools within Keyshot that allowed us to create more visualization of, of you know, of, of greater realism really created us a chance to sort of have a much more intimate look at what a model 
could be? Um, I think it's a great question, whoever asked it. Asked, thank you. Um, you know, there's clearly there's a sort of blurry sort of plush feel to this that you can almost you can you can almost pet it, right? You can almost feel it if your hand ran across the surface. Um, and you get the sense of what that would be like. Now, it can get better than this. This is this is this is as good as we can do, right? We 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 know you guys can do probably better. But when we when you when you're creating images of this level of fidelity, you're able to get a better sense of um, of the true output of, of what you're going to get on the other end. Um, you have to be careful you don't you know fool yourself because you can you can defy gravity and do all kinds of cool stuff, right? So you have to be honest. Um, but it really helped us converge and lead not just the physical design of products, but also the design language of products. Um, we converged on ideas and thoughts about, hey, this makes sense. Um, here's a material we should use across the line. Here's a color that sort of should be, you know, uh, an anchor point in our in our design language, et cetera. So absolutely. The higher fidelity helped us sort of get a deeper intimacy with our products. You know, when we receive a model like this, uh, or when we make our own, um, the fidelity is pretty low. Uh, you know, they get packed out, you know, um, in, usually in Asia and, um, you know, they, they, they get banged up in shipping and sometimes the paint sticks to the, you know, the, the wrapping paper and, you know, they look good, but they look good from a distance. You know, they don't look good really uptight like this where you can really study the model or really have that glamour shot that really feels like you really understand what's happening. Awesome. Um, one uh, uh, final question here before we kind of wrap up uh, for the session is you're sort of showing the Amazon page. And, you know, one of the things that, that's come up for many people is obviously we've added uh, AR capabilities and VR capabilities, um, you know, in Keyshot 10. And obviously that the AR abilities are really interesting from a sales and marketing, right? So like that's mm -hmm. a good example there of actually being able to see how big that chair is in your physical space and see the mm -hmm. different kind of absolutely. Options. Are you guys, um, you know, uh, looking much into AR and VR right now? And if so, kind of what's your process for, you know, evaluating those new tools and how they fit into your workflow? Well, it's a great question. I'm not sure if I could answer it uh, for a number of reasons. There's some proprietary stuff that, you know, I got to be cautious of. I think we all know that what was just asked, the question is, is sort of the obvious, right? We know that, you know, anything we can do to enrich uh, the digital shelf is important, especially with the surge in online sales. You know, we, yeah, I, sh I share with you that we have, you know, 25,000 bricks and mortar stores, but we're seeing the surge in online retail and the ability to sell and seduce online is an important one. And I think anything you can do to increase that um, is a benefit. And um, so the AR VR tools are clearly there. Um, and I think, you know, uh, in terms of retail sell-in, um, you know, if, I mean, I'm probably stating the obvious for this crowd, but, you know, the Oculus you know, Quest is like $300. It's a sensational machine, right? So you can imagine a future where, um, you know, you're going to send your buyer a web link uh, and they're going to sit back and, and, you know, strap in and, and see that thing in full high resolution 3D space, right? An immersive experience. That makes sense. Um, and um, that could be the future of collaboration. So we're looking at all those tools. It, I, I would say we're not on the bleeding edge of that. But, um, but we're certainly taking it seriously and we're certainly investing the time and, and building the core competency to do it. Awesome. Well, I'm going to take the screen here uh, from you for a moment just to uh, kind of talk a bit about what's next on the schedule. Sure. Um, a huge thank you to Frank for today's presentation. Um, as we mentioned before, all these presentations are on uh, YouTube, so you can watch them later if you had to come late or had to leave early. Um, that was really, really compelling content. Uh, we're coming back tomorrow for our final day uh, of Keyshot World. So we will be here at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time uh, with our own Kareem Merchant uh, talking about collaborative design uh, with Keyshot and Stratasys. So if you're curious about 3D printing uh, and the 3MF file format, that is uh, gonna be a really great uh, presentation. Uh, we have uh, Michael Pavlovich from Certain Affinity talking about Keyshot with ZBrush, specifically around uh, games and how he does uh, game assets with ZBrush. So definitely want to come back for that one as well. Uh, and then we're wrapping up with uh, Tyler Anderson and uh, Jack Marple from Offsite uh, talking about uh, making eye-catching eye product shots and some of the tips and tricks there. So we have one more great day of content uh, for you. Uh, again, want to thank our, our sponsors. Uh, in particular, want to thank uh, Render World and Design Burger today. Um, so we have uh, a giveaway, which I mentioned earlier. 
which is uh, a KeyShot Pro, a, a, um, a KeyShot 10 Pro license. And that is going out to Mariana Sal- Saldivar. Um, so Mariana will be following with you directly. Um, and I'm sure you'd be very excited to get your, 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 your key shot 10 license. Um, and thank you again to, um, design burger and render weekly for making that happen. Thank you again to all of our sponsors. Uh, a big thank you to Frank, Frank, any parting words for us? Hey, just, uh, just, Hey, thank you. It's an honor to, to uh, share the story and thanks for the folks at key shot. And, um, if, uh, if anyone out there is looking for an amazing, great position in Hong Kong as an industrial designer, please reach out. We are actively seeking. So. Hope to hear from you guys. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much. And we will see you all tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time.